Ron Lawrence, your local police chief, and uh, I want to thank you again for this opportunity for me to address our uh, residents and our business owners here in Costa Mesa. Uh, I, I took this opportunity about a year ago, and it's uh, always a pleasure to share with you some things that we're doing in the police department to serve you. Uh, we hire brave men and women in the Costa Mesa Police Department, and they're honored to serve the, the community of Costa Mesa and they do so uh, very uh, empathetically and professionally and it's important that we get that opportunity like this to share with you some of the things that we're doing in Costa Mesa. Our mayor John Stevens and I had an opportunity maybe six or eight months ago uh, to do what we call listening tours and we uh, very proactively went around to each district in the city and we shared with the community things that are going on with with city government uh, but specifically with the police department, initiatives that we're taking and things that we're doing to help keep your community safe. But more importantly, we also took this opportunity to listen. The mayor and I listened to members of our community about concerns that you were having, uh, things that we can do to be responsive to your needs, and we've been uh, very uh, proactive at taking care of some of those issues. So I'm proud to say that we're going to continue to do that. I know the mayor's intent is to do that with me so that we have one-on-one -on -one dialogue with our community members as often as we can. Uh, I think that's the most important thing for us to do, to hear from people and, and be responsive to your concerns. Um, th some of the concerns were similar, but some of them were very different. So our, our community here in Costa Mesa is very diverse and uh, we have uh, different personalities throughout our city with the neighborhood makeups. They're, they're all each have their own unique um, set of issues that we're able to address. So it's, it's fun to get around and meet people and hear firsthand. Uh, the mayor and I both living in our city, uh, we have some of those same concerns and we're able to make this the best city that possibly can be. We also heard a lot of positive information. I mean, our community was very supportive of not just the police department, but the city of Costa Mesa itself. And one thing I've learned is the more we engage with our community members uh, the, and we can hear their concerns and their needs, the better we all are together working to resolve issues and make Costa Mesa a special place. Some of the things that we talked about on our listening tours were initiatives that we've been taking on in the police department. and we. We've really been working on leveraging technology to help us do our jobs better. Um, for example, we have initiated what's called a bait program, and I'm proud to advertise this. Some people might think I'm crazy for sharing it, but it's really a crime deterrent, uh, first and foremost. But we have the ability to take high crime areas if we have an area that's having a, an issue with theft, and we can put uh, pieces of um, property in these high crime areas with a tracking device. And if a thief or a burglar steals them, we're able to track them and, and actually we know the property's been moved, so hopefully we can make an arrest. It's a proactive way for us to uh, ensure that we're uh, identifying criminals that are out there uh, maybe stealing, stealing property, uh, but it's also mostly a deterrent. So you never know what bait might be out there in our community um, that you not, might want to uh, not steal. The other things that we're doing here in Costa Mesa are really working with our allied partners in our region. Uh, we've got a great relationship with Huntington Beach and Newport Beach, with Santa Ana. We work very closely with those departments, with our sheriff's department, uh, and we share information, but we also share resources. So when we have incidents in Costa Mesa, it's nice for us to be able to call our allied agencies and uh, have them respond and, and help us. And likewise, we, we help them. So when you think in terms of public safety, uh, police and fire both, it's not just your local jurisdiction, it's our regional efforts that help us uh, to keep the entire region in Orange County safe. And so those are some of the things that we've been really working on. Uh, what's been a, somewhat of a challenge in the policing profession in general is recruitment, recruitment and retention. So uh, if I have an ask today, it's that if you know any young men or women who are interested in policing or serving in government, uh, this is a great opportunity. Costa Mesa is hiring. We're hiring professional people who are thoughtful, who are caring, who can uh, really talk to people and, and empathize with people. Um, we, we want to make sure that we hire the right police professionals and government officials to serve you in Costa Mesa. Uh, and to do that, we need your help because you're the ones who are best suited to help us recruit good people and have them come to work for us. So please reach out, have them visit our website. Uh, we're constantly hiring um, police officers. We have four in the police academy right now. And it's not just police officers either. It's, uh, it's the entire police department. We have dispatchers, we have record staff, we have crime scene investigators, um, and we quite often have vacancies and openings uh, for people to, to come on board. So we look forward to, to you doing that for us and um, getting some good people here to serve you in our community. Thank you, Chief. 
As you know, I have collected lots of questions from the public, and I have a, a number of them for you. The first question comes from a former police officer named Mary. Mary asked, How many boots on the ground do we have? How many are out on injury? How many are pending retirement? And how many have been budgeted? Well, I'll start with the last question first, how many are budgeted? And we're very fortunate here. Our city council has, um, a, is very supportive of public safety in our police department. Uh, I got, I've been your police chief now for about a year and a half uh, or so, and uh, when I got here, we were authorized 138 sworn. We built that up now to 141 sworn uh, to include adding a school resource officer. So we now have three school resource officers in our school districts, um, which are partially funded by the school district. So we have a great partnership with the Newport Mesa Unified School District. And we also have added a, a detective to the auto theft task force to help us uh, reduce our auto theft in the region, not just Costa Mesa, but the region. It's a countywide task force. Uh, and to address uh, catalytic converter thefts as well. That's a, that's a uh, prolific problem, uh, not just here in California, but across the nation. And we want to make sure that we're being proactive about that. So for authorized budget here in Costa Mesa, we have 141 sworn officers, and that includes everything from patrol to detectives to undercover officers to even your police chief, our administrative staff. Uh, we also have what's called professional staff. These are civilian or non-sworn uh, professional staff, such as our dispatchers and our correctional officers, our park rangers, um, and they do a, a tremendous job at helping us run the police department. And for those, we've got uh, about 82 professional staff. So that's our full contingent of staffing in the police department. Um, the numbers ebb and flow, and it's hard for me to tell you um, what, who's going to retire when uh, or to predict who might get injured because, frankly, that's quite a moving target. Uh, we've got people that uh, go out and this is a very dangerous job. It can be um, one can get injured, so we at different times we might have people out on injured leave or people who are sick or ill. We have people that have different retirement plans. So that number literally ebbs and flows on a weekly basis. So it's, it's not really something that I could put my finger on and tell you an exact number because it's largely unknown uh, at any given moment. What are you doing about the homeless issue? How many calls have been driven by homeless in 2022? What percentage of calls are homeless related? We've got um, some great partnerships there uh, working with uh, our homeless population. Uh, Nate Robbins is a city employee. He, he's a, a manager that oversees the shelter. We have a 71 bed shelter or 72 bed shelter here in Costa Mesa and that's done a great job at helping us um, help that population. Uh, our first um, prong of approach, if you will, is to offer services. We want to make sure we get folks that want help, the help that they need, whether that's uh, a place to stay uh, in the shelter, whether that's um, some type of a program such as drug addiction or alcohol addiction, or whether it's mental health help, we'll get them connected with their, their doctors and the right hospital staff. So there's a, there's a whole system that works with those that want uh, assistance, and we do the outreach quite regularly. Our community um, policing unit uh, goes out. That's one of their main focuses is the is our homeless population, and they'll work with Nate Robbins and make sure that we offer uh, individuals the help that they need. Um, and then we also make sure that we take some enforcement action. Those that are camping illegally, if we've got uh, people that are in our parks that are not supposed to be there camping overnight, we make sure that we um, don't let them do that. And if they return and we need to enforce that, we do. But we make sure we do a lot of uh, camp cleanup in, our, in the uh, river. Um, Santa Ana River, we, ha we partner with Caltrans and the Sheriff's Office because that's a multi-jurisdictional area. It's uh, very little of it's actually Costa Mesa, but um, our partners there with the county and the state get involved with that as well. So there's a lot of proactive things and I, I think that um, what we're doing is, you know, the shift from homelessness and uh, being a police issue to it being a, a, a social issue or a, a social outreach mental health um, uh, issue or assistance is, is a better posture for us to take. Being homeless is not against the law. Um, those that are breaking the law, we want to make sure that we hold them accountable and we, we prevent that from happening. But mostly this is an outreach and getting folks into the right place, getting them into the shelter and getting them into the right programs. Because a lot of these folks need and deserve help and um, they're getting the, the, right, the right help to our, our homeless shelter. The last question from Mary is, Residents are complaining about gang activities. 
Is the gang unit still operational? Yes, we do have a gang unit, and they are operational. They, they do a lot of um, not only working with our allied partners and agencies around us because uh, we want to make sure that if there's gangs from another city or another area that are coming into Costa Mesa to do bad things, that we work with our allied partners uh, from those jurisdictions to identify those that are committing crimes to make sure that we hold them accountable or, or do enforcement here in Costa Mesa or from the city that they came from. So we do have a, an active gang unit. They, um, they also do outreach in our communities to make sure that we're uh, being a positive ro role model to our youth. We've got kids in our community that we want to make sure um, they have a positive track, that they are, are family focused and they make sure that they uh, stay out of trouble and, and that they do well in school. And we want them to know that the police are here to help them, that we're here as a partner for them in their lives. Because um, there's been other areas in our, in our country that that relationship between the community and the police has not been at all that positive. And in Costa Mesa, it is positive, and we want to make sure that we maintain that. So um, our posture here is to make sure that we help our youth stay on a good, positive track. Uh, and that might even include uh, them being interns with the police department or getting jobs. Uh, our Parks and Recs, for example, uh, Recs Department has um, summer jobs. And so there's opportunities there for us to outreach to our, our local youth community and, and help them uh, be a partner with us. A lot of the questions I received were concerning speeding cars, and I know personally that the city has an approach of modifying the street to make speeding more difficult. It seems like they are punishing many people for the actions of a very few. So that brings me to the next question from resident Flo. Flo asks, speeding drivers are taking over our streets. What is your strategy to slow these drivers down? Well, in Costa Mesa, um, you know, when we look at a roadway, it's not just enforcement. So the police department's role, if you will, is enforcement. And that can be a short-term fix. Uh, it's, the intent is not to uh, punish people or give people a ticket. The intent is to change driving behaviors and save lives. So if we have people running a red light, for example, or a stop sign, or we have people speeding, the intent is to reduce those uh, violations so that we uh, reduce or eliminate traffic fatalities and we eliminate traffic accidents. Uh, we have a lot of great programs, uh, educational programs that we partner with other organizations uh, here in the police department around bicycle safety or walkability. And we work with other city departments on uh, the roadway environment, how we can make it safer for pedestrians or safer for bicyclists. Um, that's some of the most vulnerable um, people we have out there as our pedestrians and our bicyclists. So we want to make sure that we're keeping everybody safe and reducing those violations at, you know, at the same time. That's the intent. So we partner with um, the state of California. The Office of Traffic Safety provides us with some grant funding uh, for uh, enforcement and education around bicycle safety and pedestrian safety, as well as some of our DUI checkpoints come are, for, are grant funded through the state. Uh, so we do our DOI checkpoint, our driver's license checkpoint, and those have been very successful. Um, in fact, last year we had some 941 DOI arrests, which is department-wide, which is a pretty big number. And uh, so we want to make sure we focus on that. Traffic safety is important. Um, again, our enforcement piece can be a short-term fix. It can be a short-term response or resolution. But oftentimes it is about um, traffic safety and, and redesigning roadways. And we work very close with uh, Raza, Raja Seth Rahman. He's our um, director of public works. And he and his staff do a phenomenal job at engineering the roadways to make them the safest as they possi possibly can be. To include like the timing of crosswalks. And uh, he, they're doing some very innovative things. Uh, and we're, we're pleased with the work that they've been doing in our city to, to uh, increase walkability and bikeability. A resident named Josie on next door asks, My neighbors and I have called the police many times regarding donuts being done near the Mesa Verde Library. It happens almost every other day at different times of day. I feel like reporting it is a waste of time because they do it very quickly and leave the scene. Should we keep reporting them? What do you recommend? Yeah, I, I do encourage you to keep reporting them because sometimes when we, um, you, we can't be every place at the same time. Uh, last year in Costa Mesa, we responded to 131,000 calls for service. Uh, and so out of those, some of them are 
um, I'll, I won't call them low priority, but they're not in progress, they're not life safety, there's somebody doing a donut on the street, or there's somebody that's um, having a dispute with a neighbor. Uh, and then there's the other side of that spectrum where some of those calls are life safety or in progress types of crimes that we that are high priority. Uh, so the full gamut there is what we what we prioritize and we triage those calls. So if someone calls about a car doing donuts in the street, now that is a, a, a life safety because it's a traffic safety issue. So we'll get there as quickly as we can. But if we have other in progress crimes, uh, then there could be other calls that are take priority. But we do encourage people to call because if you don't call, we don't know that it's happening. Uh, you, as our community, become our eyes and our ears. We rely on you to, to share with us what's going on in your neighborhood um, because if you don't tell us, then we don't know. So please keep calling. We'll keep responding. Um, as I mentioned, sometimes we have other priority calls that, that take precedence, but we'll get there as quickly as we can. Um, in that scenario where a car is doing donuts, oftentimes the cars are gone by the time we get there. Um, but we can still make an area check for the vehicle and see if we can identify them and get a license plate number and, and do some follow-up. A resident named Wendy asks, do we still have police officer-friendly neighborhood policing? Do we still have officer-friendly neighborhood policing? Yes, Wendy, we do. Uh, I like to think your police chief is officer-friendly. Uh, I live here in your community with you. So, um, yes, and I'll tell you this, as a police chief, Two of the most important decisions I can make are who I hire and who I promote. If I hire the right people, people who care, people who genuinely care about serving, uh, who are honored to serve, if I promote the right leaders who can lead this organization with me and make sure that we're providing the right level of service that's appropriate, that's professional, that is protecting our community, that's leveraging technology to the best of our abilities, uh, that, are, that are being frugal with the taxpayers' dollars by making sure that we're being efficient with how we do our police operations. Um, it all comes back to hiring the right people who are motivated, who are caring, who are professional, and promoting the right people. Uh, we're very picky about that here in Costa Mesa because, uh, as you probably know, uh, we have a great relationship with you. We have a great relationship with our community. And it's our job to keep it that way. And we can't do that if we don't hire the right people. So we hire people who are going to be out in your neighborhood, who are friendly, who are professional, uh, who care about you and care about responding to your call. Do we get it right all the time? No, we don't. We're human too. Police officers are human too. And believe it or not, we have bad days sometimes too. But we hold people accountable to a very high level here in Costa Mesa. We have very high standards and very strict policies and procedures. And we want to ensure that uh, our officers, our dispatchers, our staff are providing the best police service possible. And to do that, we have to have a very high level of customer service and responsiveness. We want to make sure that we're responsive to community complaints. So those are two of my biggest philosophies, customer service and being responsive to our community. The last questions are from yours truly. I think the Costa Mesa Graffiti Removal Department is one of the most effective services we have in Costa Mesa. I am a prolific user of the My Costa Mesa app and am continually impressed how rapidly they respond to complaints. What are your plans to catch and prosecute these taggers? Well, I'm glad that you're using the My Costa Mesa app because that's another plug I'll make. Uh, if you get on your, your smartphone, uh, there's an app called My Costa Mesa. You can report uh, anything you want in the city, a pothole, a burnout street light, graffiti in the neighborhood. Um, you can report things like a traffic uh, a speeding complaint or somebody riding a stop sign. It's a great way for your issues to get to the right people in the city government so that we can respond uh, uh, responsibly. Um, and again, I want to tip my hat to my, my colleague, the Director of Public Works, uh, Raja Seth Raman. He's done a fantastic job. Him and his staff, the graffiti removal team that they have are extremely responsive. So when we get those calls about graffiti, they are very quick to get out there. Of course, we take pictures of it for evidentiary purposes and they notify us, um, but we want, to, we want to get rid of the graffiti as quickly as possible. And we've actually had uh, some great success at identifying uh, taggers and people that are graffitiing our city. Uh, and we've made some arrests, frankly, about uh, with people doing graffiti, um, gang graffiti or graffiti, just graffiti. And so we, we are very proactive at that. Our gang unit, again, that's one that is uh, pretty proactive in that area, as, as well as our community policing unit. Our philosophy is to try to identify those who are doing that 
If we can catch them in the act, great. If not, maybe we can identify them and still um, bring the right amount of charges. It is a crime to graffiti in, in uh, someone else's property. And so we want to make sure that we hold those people accountable. And we've had good success. As I mentioned, we've made a few, few arrests. What is the typical punishment when you catch someone? That's a good question. I don't know the exact answer, but it is a misdemeanor, a misdemeanor crime depending on the property value. If the property value is uh, worth, I think, more than $1,000, then it can be a felony. But, uh, or maybe it's $5,000. But there's a property value that delineates whether it's a felony or a misdemeanor. So if it's a misdemeanor, in the technical terms, it could be anything from a fine and probation to up to a year in county jail. Um, now, somebody doing graffiti is not going to probably do a year in county jail. But they will likely get a fine, uh, like restitution. They will likely have to serve some level of informal probation. If it's a felony, that's a different story, because then that ratchets it up with the, with the value of the property. A few years ago, there was a big effort to tear down motels with a large number of calls for service. There are currently two motels being redeveloped into apartment buildings for the homeless. Is this strategy working in reducing the number of calls? And where are your top call locations for service now? Well, that strategy, I mean, it's kind of in its infancy because they're, they're not completely, uh, that, those projects are not completely completed yet. So um, once they are, then we'll have a better picture. But I will tell you that I'm a believer in that. Um, I, I think that there's housing opportunities, and that's a, a challenging issue for any city. But I think Costa Mesa is getting it right. We've got the, the right city council, the right mayor that are taking a very forward-thinking uh, look at how you deal with housing issues. And that's kind of out of the realm of policing, but getting back to your other question, um, it's hard to decipher how many calls for service are homeless related. As I mentioned, we handled some 131,000 calls for service last year. Are a portion of those related to homeless calls or homeless encampments? Yes. Um, it's, but it's really difficult for us to decipher what, which ones are and which ones are not because it might be an assault call, or it might be a disturbing the peace call. It might be um, uh, a mental health call, and someone's just out there having a, a mental health episode, and that person happens to be homeless. One could say that's a homeless call, but really that's not the root of what's going on. What we're dealing with is what's the root of what's going on. Is there a crime? Is this a, a quality of life issue? And then we, we tackle it from there. Um, so I think those are, are, we've got some good programs, that's one of them, um, and I'm looking forward to seeing that actually come to fruition and, and uh, being successful because it's an opportunity to take some folks that are living in the streets, particularly our shelter, and get, getting them there into the right services. The last few questions touch on national issues as they affect us locally. With the collapse of our southern border and the flow of thousands of illegal immigrants crossing into our country weekly, how has Costa Mesa been impacted, and what is your policy when officers encounter people here illegally? Well, as local law enforcement, we don't do immigration. That's not our job. It's not our role. It actually never has been. There's been uh, legislation passed in the recent years that um, prohibit local law enforcement from doing immigration enforcement. But the reality is, I've been doing this 33 years, that's never been our job. That's a federal, that's a federal role. And uh, the federal ICE agents and Homeland Security, that's their, that's their purview. That's not local law enforcement. Our job is to keep the peace and make sure that we keep our communities safe. And in, in doing so, we need people to feel comfortable in trusting their local police. And that means we need to have all of our communities trusting their local police and have the ability or the feeling that they can call us when they need help. We don't care who it is that's being, a victim, being victimized. Uh, whether it's a Costa Mesa resident, a non-Costa Mesa resident, or somebody who's uh, immigrated here, we want to make sure we get them the help. If there's somebody that's a, a victim of an assault or a robbery or a sex assault, we want to make sure that they trust us enough to call us and that we can respond appropriately and get them the help that they need. That's our role. Um, the, the federal immigration role, that's a whole different uh, issue that frankly is not a local police issue. And I, as far as the impact, I, can't, I cannot tell you that we've been impacted here in Costa Mesa we're not a border community either, so I don't know that we, you know, we, we haven't seen any of that that I'm aware of. Every day in the news, we hear about the country's fentanyl crisis and how thousands of people are dying from fentanyl-laced drugs smuggled across the border. How bad is this problem, and has it hit our schools? Fentanyl is a scary issue. It's a scary issue nationwide. This is a national issue, as you mentioned. Um, Costa Mesa has not been immune to that. 
Uh, we're certainly not um, not uh, the one of the worst areas, but uh, I think fentanyl has permeated in just about every community in our country. Uh, it's a scary drug. It's uh, it's a synthetic opioid, and it's uh, unfortunately it's very very deadly. Um, so if there's any other message I can share with you, it is that uh, if you uh, know of someone that has that level of addiction or that uh, might have fentanyl in their possession, make sure that you, you call us and that you handle or do, don't handle that at all because if you touch it, it really can be lethal. Um, as far as in our schools, I don't know of any cases in our schools. We work very closely with our Newport Mesa School District in, uh, on all issues, including drug prevention and um, being proactive in our schools. And so we've, we've got um, a good relationship there. I mentioned our school resource officers and our, um, our investigations unit has done a great job at actually um, apprehending criminals that have uh, been selling uh, fentanyl, not just to Costa Mesa, but regionally wide. So they, they work in a regional effort to, to try to curtail that. And they've had great success. Our special investigations unit, which is our undercover officers, they do a phenomenal job at removing uh, fentanyl and other drugs, methamphetamines, uh, cocaine, other, other dangerous drugs from our streets here in Costa Mesa. So they've targeted the people that are selling them. Uh, and by the way, our district attorney here in, Coast, in Orange County, um, if we can identify someone who and prove that they had knowledge that they were selling fentanyl to somebody with the knowledge that it is a deadly drug, then our district attorney can charge uh, homicide charges on that individual, and he's willing to do so. And I stand with our district attorney in that posture because people who are selling fentanyl are doing so knowing that it's a deadly drug and it's killing people. And so we've got to do something to do this. And I think uh, to, to fix this, uh, in holding drug dealers accountable uh, in that manner is appropriate. And I think our district attorney and our federal partners, um, uh, our federal partners at uh, Homeland Security, um, they work with us very closely at uh, removing fentanyl and dangerous drugs from our community as well. So I want to tip our hat to them as well. They, they, they partner closely with us. It never made much sense to me why drug dealers would sell fentanyl. They are basically killing their customers. Yeah, well, they, they exploit any type of addiction they can, and that's uh, definitely one of them that they're doing. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Again, it's been a, a pleasure. and I, I enjoy being able to reach out to our community and hopefully get to know you a little bit better, or you get to know me better. And in, when the mayor and I get to do our listening tours again, hopefully later this year, uh, I encourage you to be engaged. We got a lot of great information out of those that we were able to respond to and, and just be uh, a part of our community. So thank you for that.